As most, if not all, of my viewers are probably aware right now, I report quite a bit on alien civilizations and UFOs, in spite of the fact that I have quite a number of detractors out there, a lot of skeptics. And the one thing that skeptics tend to quote, or rather the one person that they quote the most often is Carl Sagan, and his famous quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. However, one other estimate that Carl Sagan made that isn't quite so commonly quoted is the fact that according to the best statistics that we are aware of in terms of the odds of how many sophisticated civilizations capable of interstellar travel there's likely to be in the galaxy, our planet has likely been visited by other civilizations at least 10,000 times in its history. 10,000 times at least. And once again, that's without any sort of light speed travel or hyperspace or Alcubierre warp drives. And by the way, I am disinclined to believe that faster than light travel or warp drive travel, anything that allows practical travel between the stars at many times the speed of light, I tend to believe that that is actually impossible. And the reason reason I feel that way is if an Alcubierre warp drive were indeed a practical thing, at least as far as we know about that proposal, intergalactic travel would be possible also. Time travel would be possible too with a technology like that. That being the case, we should be up to our armpits in aliens. Even though there may be some civilizations that have a strict non-interference directive similar to Star Trek, we can't imagine that all of them would feel that way. So I tend to think that traveling between the stars is a lot more challenging than might be imagined in most science fiction movies. However, that doesn't mean that it's impossible possible. And once again, Carl Sagan estimated that our planet has probably been visited at least 10,000 times by sublight civilizations. And just recently, a breakthrough was announced from a very unusual and very controversial type of propulsion, which I reported on in April of last year. I reported it as being an anti-gravity drive when really it's actually an electrostatic drive, but in many ways it accomplishes the same thing. And it was recently announced by the team that's developing it that they have achieved their most critical milestone. That is to say, a constant 1G acceleration with no propellant being necessary. And if that is indeed the case, it means that humans could be traveling from here to the center of the galaxy in a human lifetime, and even travel to other galaxies would not be beyond our capability. And by the way, the best configuration for a ship that manipulates these strange forces is a flying saucer. When it comes to traveling rapidly between the stars, or at least relatively rapidly compared to the types of interplanetary travel that we understand today, the magic number is a 1G acceleration. In other words, matching the Earth's gravity constantly, 9.8 meters per second squared, approximately. So if you were to maintain that constant acceleration for a very long period of time, you could cover enormous distances in virtually no time at all. For example, if you were to maintain a constant 1G acceleration for an hour, you would cover about 60,000 kilometers. Okay, that doesn't sound like a huge distance, but if you continued to maintain that 1G acceleration, the distance covered increases exponentially. In less than two hours, you have covered 225,000 kilometers. In four and a half days, you would blow right past the orbit of Jupiter, 
and the velocity would just keep increasing exponentially from there. In 10 days, you would have blown right past the orbit of Uranus, and in 12 days, you would have already left the solar system, or at least all of the observable planets in the solar system at a distance of about 35 astronomical units. Now, catching Voyager 1 would take a little bit longer. Voyager 1 is now about 167 astronomical units from Earth, and it's taken decades to get that far, but in a mere three months, your spacecraft, if maintaining that constant 1G acceleration, would have covered a distance of approximately 3,000 astronomical units. And in less than a year, you would have not only traversed a distance of approximately half a light year, but you would also be going as fast as is physically possible in our known universe very close to the speed of light, 99.999, and you can just keep going with that figure, percent of the speed of light. Never having completely accomplished the goal of reaching the speed of light, but you would be getting very, very close to that. So what that would mean is, is after you achieve that velocity, after a one year acceleration at 1G, you would be traversing one light year for every year that passed. However, the closer you got to the speed of light, the more distance you would travel in a shorter period of time from the perspective of the passengers on board the ship. Let's briefly try to explain why that is. Let's say that you're in a car traveling at about 55 kilometers an hour or 55 miles an hour if you prefer, and you're approaching another car that's also traveling at 55 miles an hour. That means the combined approach speed of the two vehicles is a hundred. 110 kilometers per hour if measured by observers in each vehicle, whereas a stationary vehicle on the side of the road would be observing both cars traveling at 55 miles per hour. But what if a beam of light were shining on both cars from the right-hand side of our diagram? Well, logic would tell us that the car approaching the light source would register a speed of the speed of light plus 55 miles an hour for the photons, the light approaching the vehicle, that's how fast they would appear to be traveling, whereas the car traveling away from the light source would subtract 55 miles an hour from the speed of light. But that is actually not the case. Regardless of the speed of either vehicle, the speed of light remains constant. It never ever changes. So let's go ahead and take this illustration to its next conclusion. If you have a vehicle approaching a star at 90% of the speed of light, that means that from its perspective, given the fact that the speed of light is always constant, the space time from the perspective of the passengers on board is compressed. This is a phenomenon known as time dilation, meaning that even though time is is not actually traveling slower for the passengers on board, it's traveling at normal speed, it appears that the vehicle is traversing a smaller distance and traveling a lot more distance in a shorter amount of time. And it's not just appearances, it is actually in reality. And the closer you get to the speed of light, the more compressed the universe becomes until the entire universe is compressed into a halo of light in front of the vehicle with utter blackness behind you. And more importantly, time is passing so slowly from the perspective of the passengers that they are covering hundreds of light years every year that passes, or perhaps thousands or even millions of light years in a single year's time. This bizarre relationship between the speed of light and the fabric of space-time was predicted by Einstein decades and decades ago, and it was confirmed later on through many laboratory experiments. For example, there are subatomic particles called muons that only live for a few millionths of a second when they're at rest, but when traveling at their normal speed, from the normal speed for these particles, they last for years sometimes. They are traveling so close to the speed of light, they actually still only have a lifespan of a couple millionths of a second, but from our perspective, they are surviving much 
much longer than that, long enough for us to actually observe them. We wouldn't have even known about the existence of these particles if they didn't travel so close to the speed of light. So what that means is, passengers on board a spacecraft traveling to a very distant destination could reach that destination in a human lifetime, although everybody they left behind would have aged by tens of thousands of years or perhaps even more. But here's the problem. Maintaining a constant 1G acceleration is a very, very difficult thing to do. Just about any type of rocket that we can conceive of, even something powered by fusion or antimatter, anything along those lines, will run out of propulsion eventually. It will not be able to maintain that level of acceleration, that constant 1G, until it reaches 99.9% .9 of the speed of light before it runs out of propellant. Now, it is vaguely possible to create something called a bussard ramjet that constantly sucks in new fuel and ionizes it, shooting the energized ions out the back of the rocket on an ongoing basis, ions traveling very close to the speed of light anyway, therefore reducing that ongoing thrust. But one of the problems with the Bussard ramjet is there is so little material in interstellar space that you would have to have enormous scoops on this thing to gather sufficient material in order to accelerate it out the back of the rocket and get that magical 1G acceleration. As a matter of fact, these scoops might have to be the size of small planets. However, Dr. Charles Bueller, a veteran NASA engineer and co-founder of Exodus Propulsion Technologies, has revealed a startling breakthrough. I reported on this breakthrough about 10 months ago, but some big developments have happened since then. It is a propulsion drive that runs without propellant, and it challenges long-standing principles of physics. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the electrostatic drive, or perhaps you may have forgotten it from the last time I reported on this, I'll give you a quick review. The principle behind this drive is to create an asymmetric electrostatic field. That is to say, a static field that has a different amount of static electricity on one side versus the other side. And interestingly enough, when you create and manipulate this electrostatic field appropriately, it provides a gentle push on one side of the vehicle generating forward momentum. And the more energy you put into the electrostatic field, the more powerful you make it, the greater the push becomes. So the objective was to increase this push, increase the net result of this engine to the point to where a 1G acceleration could be achieved on a reasonably sized mass. Now we're not talking about a lot of mass here, we're only talking a few hundred grams or so, but nevertheless, they did manage to achieve this 1G worth of acceleration with a reasonable amount of power being fed into the system. As a matter of fact, the more they've experimented with the system, the more efficient it's become to where you get a greater push, a greater amount of thrust with a lesser amount of power being plugged in as long as the electrostatic field is being manipulated appropriately. Now, you can actually build one of these engines yourself. They have instructions on how to build one on their website. It's a very simple thing to construct. What's complicated is manipulating the electrostatic field appropriately. Now, by the way, this is not the first time in history that electrostatic fields have been used to produce thrust. The American physicist Thomas Townsend Brown created a vehicle that was capable of moving based on the interaction of high voltage electric fields with ionized air molecules. When high voltage is applied across a series of asymmetric capacitor plates, it ionizes the air molecules around the positive plate and repels them towards the negative plate. This movement of ionized particle creates a flow of ions generating thrust in the direction of the negative plate. The asymmetric design of the capacitor plates ensures that the thrust is directional, causing the vehicle to lift. And interestingly enough, Dr. Brown determined 
long before the whole flying saucer epidemic that the most ideal shape for his bifield brown effect vehicle was in fact a saucer although there was an alternative shape that also made a great deal of sense and that was sort of a flying wedge now obviously this design bears a tremendous amount of similarity to a b2 stealth bomber but in addition to that flying wedge craft were spotted over lubbock texas in 1951 and then again over phoenix during the notorious phoenix lights incident once again this is not a ufo episode per se it's simply pointing out some real life examples of craft that may have already been using this type of propulsion system decades before exodus propulsion came out with their demonstration model in 2012. But once again, the big breakthrough that simply cannot be ignored is the fact that Exodus Propulsion has managed to achieve, and this has been verified by third-party observers, a 1G constant acceleration, meaning that as long as you have a power source, you can maintain this acceleration on a given body. Now, of course, all of this still needs to be scaled up. Right now, it's only been pushing some very small amounts of mass and in the case of most of the experiments in an atmosphere how do we know that this device isn't ionizing air molecules instead and using the flow of the air molecules to produce the thrust well the reason we know is that the experiment has been duplicated in near vacuum conditions with the same results so it seems very likely that this electrostatic field is indeed generating the thrust that Exodus Propulsion claims that it's generating, but the only way to know for certain is to take it out into space, into a microgravity environment with no atmosphere, and repeat the experiments. If indeed this works again in space, and if it can be scaled up appropriately, then before the end of the century, mankind will have the ability to travel between the planets in a matter of days, and also between the stars in a very reasonable amount of time, bringing our immediate stellar neighborhood definitely within our grasp, and if you're not worried about ever coming back, the potential of traveling to other galaxies may even become a reality as well. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon and PayPal. That's what keeps this channel going is your generous support. And that being said, I'd like to welcome Joseph Anthony, our latest Patreon supporter. I'd like to thank John to Evelyn for increasing his Patreon membership. Thanks again for your support, and also, as far as the merchandise contest is concerned, the UFO folks still have the lead, but tied for second place are the Hohmann Orbital Transfer Equation folks and the Apophis Asteroid folks. You are tied for second place right now, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to do a special week of content for second place as well. If the Hohmann Orbital Transfer folks come in second place, I'll do a space flight week. And if the Apophis folks come in second place, I will do a space science week. All the details in the description. And until next time, stay angry about space.